On January 2, 2006, the Sago mine exploded, killing 13 West Virginia miners. West Virginia Senator Robert Byrd said, quote, I've seen it all before, first the disaster, then the weeping, and then the outrage. But in a few weeks, when the outrage is gone, when the ink is dry on the editorials, everything returns to business as usual. On April 5, 2010, the Upper Big Branch mine exploded, killing 29. I'm Dan Ringer, and we'll talk about business as usual at the Upper Big Branch Mine right now on a special hour-long The Law Works. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. The Law Works is made possible by the generous support of the West Virginia State Bar, the Monongalia County Bar Association, and by a major grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. The West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system. Following the explosion of the Upper Big Branch Mine, Governor Joe Manchin said, quote, we owe it to the families of the 29 miners we lost to find out what caused this, and we owe it to them and every coal miner working today to do everything humanly possible to prevent this from happening again. He then appointed J. David McAteer to conduct an independent investigation into the cause or causes of the tragedy. My guest is J. David McAteer. David, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Dan. He appointed you to do what and how? Essentially to take an unvarnished look at what happened, to take a look at what was who was responsible, and to take a look at the federal and state agencies who had regulatory authority over these mines to see whether their conduct uh, in any way uh, helped or stopped this explosion from occurring, and also make a set of recommendations about what can be done about how to stop this kind of event from occurring again. You published your report recently. You have a copy there in front of you. If the, if the viewers want to obtain a copy of this report, uh, how would they do that? Online, they can get a copy from Wheeling Jesuit University, wju.edu, and it's up on that website. If they would like to get a copy of a hard copy, they can contact my office in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, 304-876-9447. Uh, they can, you're going to have to charge, I'm sure, something for the uh, mailing and, and printing of we'll this. We'll have to charge for the mailing of the, of, the, of the document, but the printing was done at taxpayers' expense. Okay, that's wju.edu, and you can find an electronic copy there. You can download it, print it if you wish. Uh, and if you are truly interested in this, and I recommend to you that you are, if you're here in West Virginia or if you're in Kentucky or pretty much any place else where there's coal mining activity, you want to read this. It is interesting. I won't say it's easy to read because I kept becoming upset as I read it. Uh, there's a lot there. It's a tough issue. It's a tough story. Uh, we took a very simple approach. We was, I was asked at one of the family meetings by a sister of one of the miners who died to tell us what happened, tell them what happened. She said, tell it as it is. And we tried to do that very much so. And that's how we came up with this document. The second question that we were asked by a widow is, tell us how could this happen? And that, again, is a question we try to answer in this document. Who was us? Who, who are the members of your team? <clears throat> we had a team of six uh, persons. The Katie Bell, who's a recent graduate of West Virginia University Law School. Jim Beck, who's a mining executive uh, here from here in West Virginia. Pat McGinley, who is a professor of law at West Virginia University. Celeste Montfortin, a doctorate uh, with George Washington University, who worked with me at MSHA. Deborah Roberts, who works with me in my office in Shepherdstown. Beth Spence, a writer and graphic designer from Southern West Virginia. And Suzanne Weiss, who's also a 
professor at WVU. You said MSHA. You were the head of MSHA. What is that? The Mine Safety and Health Administration is a federal regulatory agency that governs mine safety and health and enforces the law through a series of inspections at those mines. You were the head of MSHA during President Clinton's administration. I was. And since then, you've done an, a, a number of investigations and reports concerning mine safety. Sadly, I've done three now. Uh, and I say sadly because that, that means we're continuing to have explosions and continuing to have death in the mines. Coal mining has always been a dangerous business. It has been a dangerous business, but I take <clears throat> the position that it's not necessarily a dangerous position, particularly in this day and age. And in point of fact, I believe strongly that we can, in fact, mine coal safely in this country and in this state, and that there are companies out there doing it day in and day out, and we ought to have a whole industry do it day in and day out. For an interesting review of the history of coal mine safety, Davitt wrote a book. Uh, when did you write this, David? 2007. For, for it's a hundredth anniversary of the disaster. The, the disaster at Mononga. The book is Mononga, and it's available at uh, bookstores pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. Look under the uh, West Virginia collection or West Virginia history collection, and it's available through West Virginia University Press. That's also, correct. so what did you do for your investigation? Who did you talk to? Where did you go? The investigation consisted of about three parts. First is the underground section, and Mr. Beck led that uh, because of his experience, and that took a great deal of time. We didn't get into the mine until June, mid-June. Why did it take uh, so long? Because the mine had to be made uh, safe entirely. Uh, it had not been, some problems had not been cleared, and there were some problems in just physically getting underground because of the fact that you had so much destruction and so much devastation, it was simply hard to do. The second is, I I again, in about June, we began to conduct a series of in interviews with miners, with fam family members, with uh, other officials, with state agencies, officials, with inspectors from the federal government, the state government, with anyone who possessed a knowledge that might be helpful to us to put together a picture of what happened and then why it happened. Were you able to determine what the mechanism was that caused this explosion? We believe we did. Okay. We have a map here that you have been kind enough to provide to us. Let's take a look. Where did it start? <clears throat> Remember that the explosion occurs on the Monday after Easter. And so on the weekend of Easter, uh, this section of the mine uh, up here, and that is in the back section of the mine, some pumps failed, allowing water to breathe, to build up and to reach the roof, thus short-circuiting to some extent the ventilation. These, these mine floors are not level. No, these mine floors are not level, and in fact, the dip is in that direction. So there is a dip, and the, the tendency is to collect water in that dip and up, up in the top section as well. The long wall face, and this is about a thousand foot long wall face, is just here. They're mining in this direction. This is the face extending the, like that. Of that. And the face of a long wall works not unlike a planer. It's a large planer, five or six feet tall, that comes along and scrapes at the coal, fall, has causing the fold of coal to fall down onto a metal conveyor belt that's at the bottom of the wall, and then it's conveyed out to a second conveyor belt and outside the mine. The worked out area, called the gob, is behind it, and the workers are supported in a series by a series of hydraulic lifts that form the second section of the long wall. And those hydraulic lifts, and there would be probably 800 of them, um, they have canopies on top of them that serve to protect the miners and serve to f cause the long wall to move forward. It's all done hydraulically. It's all done in a mechanical way so that the miners never have to get out into this virgin territory, nor do they have to go back into the worked out area. So this area is where coal is to be removed. 
this area is where gob or the waste is stored behind the, exactly. the mining machine. But what you want to happen is after you clean this out and you've mined out the coal, uh, you have a 95% void there. And what you want to do is you want the roof to fall in so that you take pressure off the front <coughs> section. Now you will note that they didn't have very long to go before the long wall had to stop. And that's an important factor in understanding this explosion. But on April the 5th, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the long wall had been the shear, the cutting part of the long wall that has nozzles on it uh, to spray water, but also has teeth on it to cut the coal, and it rotates around. That shear had been had a mechanical problem. At about 2.45, they had a, resolved the mechanical problem, now began to uh, attempt to reignite, or restart the long wall. And it's at this point, when it's down toward the tailgate, it's at this point that we believe that a body of methane gas migrated in from the gob area, came in contact with the sparks that are created, that were created in this instance by the sheer cutting uh, of stone, sandstone above the coal, and that ignition created a fireball in this area. The miners who were down here at the time tried to get away from the danger and move from 160 shield down to about 105 to 106 So shields. this was not a huge catastrophic explosion that occurred all at once? Not initially. They saw danger and reacted That's to it. That's exactly right. And they did a second thing is they called out to the head gate operator and suggested to him that directed him to cut power to the long wall. So at 2.59 and some seconds, power was cut to the long wall, and that's a two-step manual operation. It couldn't be done inadvertently. It had to be done intentionally. They were not able to make their escape. Uh, as this methane ball now begins to sip, get out into the tailgate section, it heads back toward the entry of the mine or deeper into the mine, and, but also heads out toward the portals and out into the other working sections of the mine. The entry to the mine was in that direction. The entry to the mine is, sits out here. Uh, it, it is about, at this point, it is about uh, 80 uh, breaks away from this particular turn. Okay, we ought to talk about what a break is. You can see on the map that there are rectang basically rectangular shapes. These are breaks. That's exactly right. What, are, what is a break? In mining, in the non-long wall section, in the regular mining, continu con conventional mining, you take the red squares and leave the black squares like, like you do on a checkerboard. And the black squares are left there to hold up the roof. The red squares are taken. And these are just the squares that have been removed. The coal has been removed from these sections. These, these parts are the coal that remains. These breaks then constitute, and they're, within the breaks there are traveling roadways, there's conveyors, there's emergency ways, etc. And they are all designated uh, so that the miner knows how to get out and how to come in. And break, basically you count them from the entrance of the mine as you go into That's the mine. That's exactly right. And so, so that by, by virtue of saying I'm at 78 break, I can tell you that you're at this section here, uh, because that's where the break occurs. Then this is the 78 break is from the portal to this break or to this div divide, and then you begin to start again counting again. So it's a mechanism of helping you understand where the mine, where you are in the mine. Now, as the explosion gets into this tailgate of one north, it encounters coal dust that has not been made inert by the application of rock dust. That coal dust is a very fine dust, and it becomes airborne by the force of the air that's pushed in front of the fireball. So the, so the air, the explosion occurs, pushes air ahead of it. That air hits the coal dust, kicks it up it into the air. Makes it airborne. Aerosol, aerosolizes exactly it, basically. Exactly right. It makes it airborne, and now the coal dust itself begins to explode. And coal dust releases a tremendous amount of energy in small particles like this is. And it starts to push in front of it also a 60-foot wedge of air and explosion that is occurring, and that again kicks up more coal dust once again and causes that to have 
multiple explosions. It sounds to the human ear like one explosion, but it's multiple explosions that occur in milliseconds. And that explosion then spreads all the way out this way. It spreads across the crossover. It goes back into the tailgate section and up into the headgate section as well. Into the glory hall is, is some. We know this because there's a forensic science post mine disasters that enables us to look at the results i.e. the soot that's left after an explosion and we can tell whether it's burned or not. You will see on the map uh, names and, and labels victim number six, thirteen, seven. These are the men and the locations that they died in. And interestingly, you've got some up here, victim 21, 14 through 19, 20, and 21, a considerable distance away from where the explosion occurred. This explosion carried throughout a long distance of a mine, and, and which suggests again to us that the footprint of the explosion is a footprint of a coal dust explosion. And that's one of the reasons why we conclude that that footprint and the soot, remaining soot, uh, is indicative of a coal dust explosion. Now, the men who were working on the long wall or at the long wall themselves, you knew that they had some premonition of, of a problem because they were not found where you otherwise expected them to be. Long wall operators and long wall crews are very much committed to the long wall and they recognize that that's the machine that makes the mine operate and makes the company profitable and makes them have jobs. And it is quite unusual, and we studied this question for a long time, it is most unusual for them to have gone as a group uh, this distance away from the long wall itself. The long wall is down here, as I say, at 170, 169 break and they go back to 106 or 105, that's quite unusual and it's very hard to explain. How, how, approximately how far is that? Uh, that would be 200 feet, some number like that. So it sounds like they maybe were running away from where this was started. Yes, and the movement is very difficult and very convoluted because you, go, you have to crawl over these chocks that form the basis of the hydraulic lifts that keep the wall together. And to do that, you have to lift your legs up and crawl. It's a, it's a very difficult movement pattern. And for them to make that distance suggests to us that it was quite a distance and quite, they were quite moving quite quickly. Now, this explosion now spreads out and, and devastates this whole area. When it hits the end back there where the virgin coal is and the same here, then it will rebound and, and ricochet back into the mine. And so we see evidence underground of the explosion going in two or three directions. And there's evidence of those directions uh, coming out, particularly toward the portal and out this section. At about this point where this cross this break occurs is where the, the coal peters out where there's no longer any fuel for it and the men who die up in this section on headgate at I'm sorry on man trip number one die from carbon monoxide poisoning rather than from being burned or being impacted by the explosive force. There were a variety of mechanisms by which these men died. Some died in the explosion the the trauma of the impact of the explosion. Some, well, their bodies, it's, I guess it's difficult to tell how they died because their bodies were so badly burned. And some asphyxiated from the carbon monoxide. That's correct. These men did not all die at once. No, they didn't, and there's some evidence that uh, some of the men, particularly on the man trip number one, survived for a period of time. A man one, trip is a, is a very low vehicle in which they lie down and are traveled brought into and out of the mine. Right. One man survives on the man trip, uh, an individual who then tries to place the self-contained self-rescuers on his fellows, and he gets it on each one of them and then runs out. He's about out of air on his self-contained self-rescuer, so he now makes an effort to exit out the mine, and he comes down to <clears throat> break 66. Um, I'm sorry, it comes down to break 48. He was at 66, that's where the man trip was impacted. And he comes down to 48 and sees individuals trying to come in to the mine, and he is rescued and brought out of the mine. What was his name? Timothy Blake. I say was, is. He survived this. He has survived this. But uh, he, he... Quite a wonderful man. He did some really heroic work trying to save his absolutely, brothers. Absolutely, absolutely, without question about it.
He, he put the uh, breathing apparatus on each one of them that was in the man trip. Yes. Checked each for pulse, uh, tried to help them. But at some point he realized that his uh, self-rescuing unit was about to run out of air. The self-rescuing units last, uh, we're sure that they last an hour, and he'd been at it about an hour, just less than an hour, and he made the right decision to try to take himself out. He said it was the hardest moment. thing he ever did. Yes, he did. We have another map here that shows in red the areas that were burned. Now, this is the long wall face, is that the right term? That's correct where the explosion started in this point, and then you can see where in, the, in red where the explosion, where the fire was. I find it interesting though, David, it seems to be that places are missing. Uh, there are red dots and then no red dots. How, how does it happen that everything didn't burn? <clears throat> well, let's go back to the fundamentals of this map. The way we've done, uh, what the in, in investigators did was take a series of samples of soot, uh, basically remaining after the explosion, some 1,800 and some samples, and then analyze those samples using an alcohol coke test. And those samples can tell you whether you have volatile material, some that didn't burn, or burned up material, i.e. ash. And those places where you have ash are indicative of places where soot, or I'm sorry, where coal dust ignited, where you had a burn. And that burn goes uh, down toward the portal, goes into the crossover, goes up into these areas of the mine all the way back where the men are working. There are some anomalies right here, for example, where the burn doesn't appear to occur, but there is burn on one side or the other. That is explained by the fact that if the ignition gets going so fast, it, does, it goes over some of the dust and doesn't cause that dust to burn. And that explains by this. This coke dust test, this alcohol coke test, <clears throat> has been around uh, since the 1940s and probably before that. It has been used in this country and abroad, and it is the best test we have to determine what happened and where it happened and what, what strength it was. And it rates the burn in high, medium, and low. These were all pretty much high burned areas so that there was a great deal of energy and a great deal of force. In the sections going back past the gob, uh, this area was tended to be wet in both the tailgate and the headgate of the long wall. That suggests that there was too much moisture that would not allow the coal dust to ignite. Um, what this does say, however, the fact that the burn occurs in such a large section is that the preventive measures, the use of rock dust, was inadequate, seriously inadequate and deficient, and that allowed this explosion to spread. Could this uh, have been prevented? Was it necessary for this to happen? This was a preventable explosion. Um, our conclusion is, and, and we, I strongly believe this, uh, that the uh, ignition um, was not an accident, that the ignition was a failure, a systematic failure to follow very basic safety precautions and ones that we know and ones that we have had in place in this country and around the world for a hundred years. And we didn't do that. Why weren't these procedures followed? I can't go and explain, I can't go into the minds of the individuals making the decisions. I can tell you some of the background that we now understand and some of the suggestions that have been put forward as to why they were neglected. The long wall, as we pointed out, had a short period of time, duration of time left to go. The long wall has to have a place to go. It costs in the neighborhood of 40 to $50 million. And it needs to have a place to go to operate. And those miners knew that, and their managers knew that, and superintendents knew it. So there was a great push to get that long wall completed and to get it into that upper section. When you're, when you're talking about the long wall, that's the machine and the place where it works. That's the machine itself. The machine itself. The place where it works is the location for the long wall. And it was to go up to that higher section, the head gate 22, where we saw the, the mine explosion occur. 
We're talking about the report of the governor's investigation panel into the causes of the Upper Big Branch coal mine explosion on April 5, 2010. The explosion resulted in the deaths of 29 West Virginia miners. My guest is David McAteer. He's the chair of the investigation, and he's the former head of the U.S. Mine Safety and Health Administration. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. There were three general things that you looked at uh, that were causes of what happened. I suppose the actual cause was an explosion of a bubble of methane gas. Let's talk about where methane comes from. Methane is created at the same time that the coal is created back in the Carboniferous period. And it's essentially a carbon-based product, much like the coal is, but it is under different pressures, uh, geologic pressures, that result in coal and or result in methane. So it occurs simultaneously in the vein of coal itself. It can occur above it, it can occur, occur below it. And it is in, typically in pockets. And it's a migratory gas that will come out as you mine the coal and as you cut the coal, it will allow the methane gas to breed out. That is a well-known phenomenon, we know that. And there are methods to prevent that to, from becoming explosive. Now, when we, when we heat our houses, uh, or cook on our gas stoves, basically we're using the same gas. That's exactly right. Methane is essentially the gas that you get in your, your range at home. It's very much equ equivalent of uh, natural gas. There's some very minor differences, but no differences that make any difference with regard to this explosion. And that methane gas uh, occurs naturally. It occurs in many, many coal mines, particularly in West Virginia, and we've been accustomed to dealing with it for 100 years. So methane itself was the primary fuel source that started this? The, 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 it was involved in the ignition. It was methane, and it's our considered opinion that the, the methane ignition is what starts the ball of fire. Now let me go back for a minute. On long walls, you have these cutting teeth, and those teeth strike sandstone that's above the coal or strike minerals inside the coal seam itself, and they create sparks. That's a known phenomenon. To address that, we have added many, many water sprays and have added uh, large amounts of ventilation. And that ventilation does two things. One, it sweeps away the methane that comes out of the gob and is up near the cutting place, but it also provides positive pressure on the gob so that the methane stays within the gob area. Okay, let's, let's take a step back. The gob area was the area behind the long wall. That's correct. Which was waste products uh, that were generated through the mining it, process. It's a, void, it's a void that is created after the coal is mined. There are some rocks that fall into it. There's a little bit of waste, but it's really typically a void or an area that has been mined out. So uh, methane can come from, I suppose, cracks in the walls and the floors and places oh, like absolutely. that. But you've got this material that has fallen in, the pressure's relieved on it, so the gas starts to come out of it. That gas is methane, it's explosive. That's correct. So to keep that from happening, the we long do, wall itself sprays water where it's cutting? We take two, two steps, two fundamental steps, is we add water sprays to the long wall shear so that when the teeth strike the rock stone, or the, the sandstone, or strike the coal minerals, if they create a spark, that spark is, is put out by the presence of streams of spray. Just like a sprinkler head in a, in a hotel room or it's something not, like that? It, it's not unlike the sprays in your grocery store that spray onto the produce. It's a little stronger than that, and it's on a continuous basis. But that's the kind of idea, is that you keep that spray going, and that will cause the ignition source, i.e. the spark, to go out before it ignites the methane. We found that those sprays on the long wall had either become, a number of them had either become blocked or had been dismantled. Disman taken off the machine? Taken off. And it was a question for us. Why would anybody in their right mind take these, take these protective things off their machine? Well, there's more to the story. This company, not unlike other companies, used river water, used water from the Coal River 
to cool the machines and to provide these sprays. This company is Massey Energy. That is Massey Energy at this upper Big Branch mine. And they use that river water to put into the spray systems to have it. River water has sediment in it. Sediment will block those nozzles. In fact, there was a filter, or a couple of filters that were attempted to be used. Those weren't properly maintained. Those weren't properly operational. So the sediment was allowed to get through, in fact, to the nozzles. Those nozzles become clogged, and those nozzles become inoperative. The miners are faced with a dilemma, a Hobson's choice. They can either operate without the sprays, at, without the water at all, or they could try to get some water to the operation by one, sticking a nail in or some other thing into the nozzle to try to open it up a little more uh, to get water out, uh, or they can take the nozzle off entirely. It appears that in this instance, there were seven or eight of those nozzles that were taken off entirely. We have evidence from the testimony that management was fully aware of this practice and that the practice had been ongoing. What the miners on the long wall were trying to do was at least have some water. If you didn't have any water, then you have dust uh, and you have the sparks and you have coal dust itself. The miners told management about this? We have evidence from the testimony that they did indeed tell them. Management failed to act on that. Why wouldn't the union do something about this? This is not a union mine. This so, is a non-union mine. So the UMW has no right to come in and complain or call the miners out on strike because of a safety issue? Or? None whatsoever. So these guys could shut down and say, we won't work, but they risk their jobs. Absolutely. They, the, the statute, the federal statute and the state statute provides that if you want to walk off work, walk off the job, for safety precautions, for safety reasons, you have a right to do that. The difficulty is when you walk off the job, you leave your job. Uh, and that's the practice and the custom and uh, that has existed in this state and for that matter and for all over the country. So that that right under the statute is very limited. Job abandonment in West Virginia is a cause for dismissal. You could, I suppose, file a lawsuit and years later you might get something back for that. That's correct. And it would take you a, a minimum of a year to get anything. And not too many miners have a year's worth of savings that can, they can spend on a lawsuit to get their job back. So they have a choice, make a living or run risk? Or run risk, but it's also they were at least trying to get some water to try to get some spray action to get, try to get something going. But what that does is that it defeats the function of these nozzles. Much like if you take a nozzle off of your water hose, the water will still come out, but it doesn't come out in a spray fashion. And it comes out in a, in a, a stream. And that stream doesn't knock down these sparks and doesn't keep the methane, make the methane not ignite those. Talk to me of ventilation. The ventilation at the Upper Big Branch has a troubled past. Um, it had trouble in the months leading up to this disaster. It had trouble in the days leading up to this disaster. And we think it was involved. Its failure to have adequate ventilation was part of the reason this mine blew up. Ventilation is a simple process in mining. You essentially, essentially take fans, large fans, industrial sized fans, and blow large quantities of air through the underground workings. You can also take a fan at the back end of the mine and suck the air out. That was done in this case, so it was called a push-pull system. They had adequate capacity on the fans to provide sufficient air for this mine. But because of the large geographic amount of openings underground, some 10 miles or more, the division of the direction of the air is very problematic. This was a physically very large mine. Physically a very, very large mine. And in other sections and other cases, uh, sections of this mine would have been closed off or a mine would have been closed off and you would have concentrated your area in the working area. That wasn't done in this case. This mine goes back to the 1950s uh, and, and a tremendous amount of the mine is still in operation or still working. The ventilation pushing now uh, begins to suggest that you want to get um, 
40,000 feet was the requirement that IMSHA had cubic feet per minute across the face of the long wall. That amount, that 40,000, was a reduced requirement that IMSHA had allowed the company in a few months before this explosion occurred. It had been 50,000. The mine had been producing 150,000 uh, cubic feet per minute uh, in the periods of time in the years prior, but it had become reduced dramatically. We think that that has a very strange, a very strong impact on the explosion, because as I mentioned, you push the air along across the long wall, it pushes positive pressure on the worked out area or the gob and keeps the methane from migrating over into the area where the sparks are. It essentially blows it away. It essentially keeps, it keeps that, it does two functions. It blows away the air that's in front of the wall, that's along the wall, it takes any gas with it, but it also is like a, a, just a pressurized area that keeps the methane from coming into the working area. So it has that second function. It didn't operate that way in this instance, and we think that didn't happen because the one, the level of methane across the face, I'm sorry, air across the face was inadequate, but more to the point, there were problems in the ventilation system as it was designed and as it was operated. This company had chosen for whatever reason, uh, not to use the more permanent methods of drafting air and, and, and making air changes. Air can be changed in two different ways. One is through the use of locking air doors or air lock doors, uh, or two, uh, overcasts. And the overcast is a permanent tunnel, in effect, that allows miners to walk in, but allows the air to go over that uh, air section uh, to get to provide deeper into the mine. These overcasts are more expensive, uh, but they are permanent in nature. Um, and so the company in this instance chose to use airlock doors. Um, these airlock doors are a problem, and it's a problem because of humanity, because of us. Um, there were 14 or so airlock doors between the portal and the working sections. Those 14 airlock doors are subject to getting beat up, getting hit by uh, traveling equipment, getting left open. Because each time you go through one of these airlock doors, you have to get up, open the door, put your equipment through or put yourself through, go back, close the door. Well, you're asking 150 to 200 men uh, to do that every day without fail. Uh, we know we're all flawed and we will leave them open sometimes. Or they get banged up and they allow air to course underneath them so they don't provide the, the, don't provide the protected air getting inside the mine. Those doors were problematic for this particular time. And we think that had an impact on it. And we have evidence from the testimony of the miners who died, from their testimony to their friends and colleagues, that there was not enough air getting to the working sections of the mine. We're talking about the report of the governor's independent investigative panel into the causes of the Upper Big Branch coal mine explosion of April 5th, 2010. The explosion resulted in the deaths of 29 West Virginia miners. My guest is J. David McAteer, former head of the U.S. Mine Safety and Health Administration and chair of that panel. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. Was the company unaware of this? Now, the company had to be aware of it because they went underground just as their supervisors went underground just as often as the miners did. They had been, complaints had been given to these uh, supervisors, uh, suggestions and demands and requests had been made to provide more air to Headgate 22, to Tailgate 22, to the long wall. Um, and what would happen is that the, uh, changes would be made on an ad hoc basis. If there wasn't enough air on Headgate 22, the foreman would go down and make a change back in the air controls in the further out section to get air to his men. Well, what that would do would be to rob the other sections of air. Then that individual would make a change. It was a very much of a pickup game and very much of a, a non-engineered ventilation system. I think anybody who has forced air heating in their homes knows that if you open a vent in one room, you have to either go close one somewhere else or you're going to suffer a loss of air or heat in that other room. The same is true if, if you have central air conditioning. Balancing home heating, home cooling exactly. systems is very difficult. And you're dealing with a mine that is tens of miles 
of worth of tunnels and, right. and working areas. It's, it's, it's not an easy task. The underlying problem was that they didn't have good engineering for this practice. The engineers were young uh, individuals, uh, many of whom didn't participate underground, didn't visit underground, but made the changes that were suggested to them by the supervisory personnel, and they, those changes were then submitted to the federal agency, and they didn't have a good working knowledge of what was functioning underground and what was happening there. Richard Klein, who is an assistant district manager for the Mine Safety and Health Administration's Mount Hope office, was concerned about this lack of engineering, and he said, quote, we're not engineering mines, we're trying to use duct tape to fix things instead of engineering. We're not taking the time to look ahead. And he was talking about the entire industry. It is a problem with the industry where we don't have enough engineers, we don't have enough trained uh, ventilation engineers to be able to provide us with that. And it's a, it's a great shortage. And as we go deeper and as we go further underground, uh, we're going to need better engineers rather than fewer engineers and more of them. And we're not providing that kind of graduation rate from our, law, from our engineering schools. There's a tendency, as we think back at the history of coal mining, to think it's a grunt labor job, pick and shovel, load 16 ton, and it's a high-tech industry. Oh my goodness, the long wall uh, equipment, as I say, is a 40 to 50 million dollar investment. Uh, it can produce uh, millions of tons of coal in a year's time. It is very sophisticated. It is very uh, modern. It is very high-tech. It is very phenomenal just to watch it operate. Um, and so, no, we're not in a low-tech business any longer. We're in a high-tech business. And the coal From miners are not low-tech pick-and-shovel guys. Absolutely not. It's all done with computers. It's all done by handheld uh, uh, um, control devices. Uh, it very, very, I, I know of no uh, pick-and-shovel operations that exist in this country today. But let me make one distinction, and it's terribly important. While we have made the leap from technology in the production side, we have not made the leap in safety and health side. We are still taking readings for methane. We are still making pre-sift examinations using pencil and paper, and that pencil and paper note is passed on from one person to the other before it gets to the surface and before it's rendered uh, into the book, and the book is the same type of books that we used in, in the 1920s. Well. At the Upper Big Branch Mine, were they even doing that? There's evidence that they were not doing adequate pre-shift examination. There's evidence that some of the pre-shift examiners never even turned on their methane detection devices, despite the fact that they filled the form out that, that said they did. Okay, wait a minute. They carried portable methane detection devices. In the old days, it was a canary in a cage. That's correct. But they had these devices to check methane label levels and they didn't turn them on? We have evidence that they didn't at one individual, at least one individual and perhaps others, didn't turn them on during the time that they should have had them on and should have had taking sample readings and taking detections. But they were returning or they were recording levels that were safe. But they didn't know. I had no idea, none whatsoever. There were also methane detectors on some of the machines. That's correct. Wouldn't they have warned the miners that methane levels were too high? They should have. Uh, we think the explanation there is that in the case of the long wall, the long walls have, as I indicated, supporting canopies that serve to allow the miners to work on it and to bring the whole machine together. Those canopies have a void in them on the upper part of that canopy. And we believe that the methane migrated through that canopy and onto the long wall striking area or where the where the sparks were. Came in over the machine. It's light, so it goes to the roof. It's, it it's, migrates across the top of the machine onto the face. Right, and the sampling devices are at a lower level. The sampling devices either on the individual who would be on their belt or on the long wall itself or on the, on the railing uh, or in a few instances on 
the uh, long wall cutter, and those would have been below the point where the ignition, where the sparks were occurring. We think that's what explains, because we too had that question. Well, if you have these devices, why didn't they kick off? And none of them seemed to have kicked off. They did not look like they'd been tampered with. Uh, but we think that that explains what happened and how that methane got to the sparks without being detected. And again, if the ventilation had been proper, it would have taken care of the, at least most of the methane. And if the water sprays had been proper, it would have taken care of the sparks themselves and would have put them out. Now, it has been suggested uh, by Massey that there was a huge influx of methane into the mine through a crack in the floor or something, and that that was what caused this catastrophe. We examined that question very carefully. They had had three other infusions in the previous years, one in 97, and one in 2003, and one in 2004. And we looked at the record to see what steps they had taken to prevent those infusions from occurring again, or if they did happen, what could be done to, to make them, neutralize them, or make them safe. Neither on the part of Massey, nor on the part of MSHA, were steps taken to make those infusions, to neutralize those infusions. So we're still back at square one, despite the fact that we'd had experience. Secondly, we looked at the question of what would a methane, what would a natural gas explosion look like? Their suggestion is that you have about a million cubic feet coming up from a break in the floor. We looked at the breaks in the floor, and there are a lot of them on this long wall, uh, as there are with most long walls. Because as you clear out that void, that the coal, you create a void, and Mother Nature hates a void and tries to hoove up. We looked at the, the <clears throat> breaks that are near where this explosion occurred. They are in terms of a geologist not rooted. What that means is they don't go down into a cavity below the mine, but they go down three, four, five feet and stop. And we were able to examine some of those uh, cavities and some of those breaks and find that they didn't have access to natural gas beneath them. But notwithstanding that fact, we took the question straightforward of, okay, let's suggest that we had a million cubic feet. What would we expect the footprint of the explosion to look like? The footprint of the explosion in this instance does not look like a natural gas footprint. You would expect to have quite a bit of devastation right at the location where the, where the ignition begins. We don't have that kind of strong devastation. We have strong devastation in other sections of the mine, but not right around where the ignition occurs. There is devastation, but it's not of the level of the magnitude of the force. There's another factor that we have to talk about, and that is uh, dusting the mine, rock dusting the mine, uh, to keep that powdered coal out of the air. What did you find there? Well, we think that the coal dust was a big part of the explosion. In fact, the major reason for the explosion having spread to the mine was such devastation and killing all the individuals who are remaining in the mine. If the ignition occurs on the long wall and the miners try to move away from the long wall, they might have died from the results of that ignition on the long wall. But the remaining mem <coughs> members of the crews, those working on other sections at great distances away from the explosion, would not have died. And those miners died, we strongly believe, as a result of coal dust ignition. Once the methane moves out into the entries of the mine, it kicks up this coal dust, and the coal dust then goes and spreads itself out into these other sections. That is the footprint of an explosion that results from coal dust. And the footprint that we found at this mine following this explosion is a footprint of a coal dust explosion and not a natural gas explosion. There were autopsies performed on most of the bodies of the miners. Uh, one evidence of coal dust is black lung. What did you find? There are 29 miners' bodies who have autopsies performed on them. We were able to get adequate samples of tissue from 26 of those miners. Of that number, 70, some 71 percent had evidence of co-workers' pneumoconiosis or black lung. That's an astounding number, astounding percent. The standard 
way to look at black lung is to look at black lung on x-rays of minors who are at work. So we're slightly off in comparison. We're using autopsies, but we're comparing that to the x-rays. In x-rays, we expect to find, as a, as a common matter in this country, about 3%. In West Virginia, we expect to find closer to six and a half or seven percent. In this case, we found 71 percent. That's a that's a very disturbing number and very concerning number. There have been some studies recently in the last three or four or five years that suggest that the dust that the experience with black lung is increasing. Uh, and we think it's a couple of reasons. One is these machines, they're cutting machines that become much more powerful and are able to cut the rocks next to the coal quite easily. Well, typically that's a sandstone rock that contains quartz that compounds your exposure to coal dust and gives you a greater chance to have black lung. And secondly, they move with such rapidity and so fast that again, they create the dust so quickly, and now with black lung, it's uh, microscopic size levels. But if you have coal dust on the ground, then that suggests to you, just as you said, that you have microscopic levels, or i.e. black lung producing coal dust. I That's thought black lung was a creature of the 50s and 60s. We all hoped that it was. But the evidence now suggests that we need to take, and we need to take quickly, a, a very hard look at that question. The coal was, the mine was supposed to be dusted, limestone rock was supposed to be placed in the mine to keep the coal dust down. Apparently it was not or not at adequate levels. We looked very, very hard at this question because it's so terribly important. It keeps that explosion from spreading and the explosion spread. So we went back and said, all right, let's look at the equipment. And we went to the manufacturer of the equipment. The equipment was made in the 1970s or 1980s um, by a firm in Parkersburg. Uh, they don't have record of when this piece of equipment, because it's so old. They had rebuilt the equipment once or maybe twice. It had not been rebuilt for a number of years. It was, it was not, also, it was not a question of did we get enough dust, because we didn't have enough crews to lay the rock dust down. We didn't have enough crews to adequately rock dust the sections of the mine that the miners were working in. We systematically looked at that and found that the rock dusting was simply not being done, and that allowed this explosion to spread out. David, thank you very much. Uh, your schedule is horribly busy right now. I know how hard it was for you to get here. Thank you very much for coming here for us. You can get your own copy of the report of the investigation of the Upper Big Branch explosion put together by David's uh, panel by going to wju.edu, that's the Wheeling Jesuit University where David is vice president, and downloading it, read it, print it as you would. Some involved in this matter are taking the fifth. They're refusing to cooperate in these investigations. Some are blaming unforeseeable and uncontrollable events. But according to Coal Age Magazine, which is an industry standard publication, quote, the next time you're about to say accidents will happen, stop and think first. Only the weaklings and the incompetents evade responsibilities in this age of industrial safety and efficiency. Accidents must not happen." End quote. The Upper Big Branch explosion occurred on April 5, 2010. Coal Age said that on May 27, 1916. For The Law Works, I'm Dan Ringer. Good evening.
If you have a legal problem and want to know if you need a lawyer, you can discuss your problem with a lawyer by calling 1-800-642-3617 Tuesday evenings from 6 to 8 p.m. That's 1-800-642-3617. On the LawWorks webpage at thelawworks.org, you'll find a listing of recent The LawWorks program topics and additional information about this show's topic. If you would like to recommend this program to a friend, you'll find a video of the program at the LawWorks website. You'll also find free video and podcasts of previous programs on YouTube and iTunes. If you would like to suggest a topic for a future program, or if you're a school teacher and would like to receive a free copy of this show for classroom use, send us an email to thelawworks at comcast.net. The Law Works is made possible by the generous support of the West Virginia State Bar, the Monongalia County Bar Association, and by a major grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. The West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.